you have before you a man who was quite a personage in his way, Truscott of the Yard. Never heard of Truscott. The man who tracked down the limbless girl killer? Or was that sensation before your time? Who'd kill a limbless girl? She was the killer. How'd she do it if she was limbless? I'm not prepared to answer that question to anyone outside the profession. Don't want a carbon copy murder on our hands. Do you realise what I'm doing here? No. Your every action's been a mystery to me. That is as it should be. The process by which the police arrive at the solution to a mystery is, in itself, a mystery. And we've reason to believe a number of crimes have been committed under your roof. There's no legal excuse for a warrant. We had no proof. However, the water board doesn't need a warrant to enter private houses, and so I avail myself for this loophole in the law. It's for your own good authority behaves in this seemingly alarming fashion. Does my explanation satisfy you? Oh, yes, Inspector. You have a duty to do. My personal freedom must be sacrificed. I have no further questions. Good. I shall now proceed to bring the crimes to light, beginning with the least important. What's that? Murder. The circumstances of Joe Orton's death were as bizarre as anything in his plays. The author of Loot and Entertaining Mr. Sloan was battered to death at the height of his career by his lover, Kenneth Halliwell, in their one-room flat at Noel Road, Islington. Did you go to the flat? Yes, I went to the flat, yeah. Yes, it was terrible. Well, the, the police inspector at the time, he says, asked me if I was squeamish, because it was in a terrible state, really. It looked like somebody had been throwing red oxide over the wall and the ceiling, that's how bad it was. But I never seen John like that. Obviously, when I went down to identify him, he was sitting up in bed with a bandage around his head. There was no bruising on his face whatsoever. He must have been laying face down, I think, when Kenneth went crackers. For 15 years, Joe Orton and Ken Halliwell had lived and sometimes written together in their shabby bed-sitter in North London. They'd shared everything except success. But on August the 9th, 1967, as John Lahr, their biographer, puts it, murder made them equal again. When I started writing Prick Up Your Ears, I very much wanted to come down Noel Road just to get a sense of the world that Orton and Halliwell lived in wrote about, a world of no circumstances. And I remember walking in the door, the smell of ammonia on the linoleum, the wallpaper, which was peeling, and it was a rather dilapidated, sad feeling one got. In the sheds at the back there, Orton and Hallowell had kept their bikes, where they used to take sorties out and around London to look at the architecture to go up to Hampstead Heath. When I got to the top floor, I didn't want to go in, because the house was reoccupied and it had been redecorated. And I had a very strong feeling about that room. Well, I came home and uh, I looked up at my bedroom, which is above here, and the lights were out. And I thought, oh, thank God, they're asleep. But I saw their light on. I thought, that's strange, the boys, because I always call them the boys. The boys having their light on at this time of the night. I got up in the morning, got my son off to school. Aldi it came down. By the way, Eleanor, he said, I saw Joe at half past seven last night and he told me he was going down to meet the Beatles manager and if everything went well, he would be signing a contract for £100,000. Uh, he said, when he comes back, he's going to come in and let us know how he's got on. Good. When I came back in the afternoon, there was the BBC, the ITV, the police. I, I thought, goodness me, he's really had a hit. I was so thrilled for him and... Uh, I came to the, 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 the doorstep and I looked at Aldo and I said, oh, it's, it's all happened. Let's come inside. I said, he's had a hit. He said, he has, he's dead. I just couldn't believe it, because while we were in the kitchen, 
They were dead upstairs. They'd been dead, I don't know how long. Both of them. Hallowell, whose bald head was just visible through the letterbox, had taken 25 Nembutols, of which he'd uh, swallowed with a glass of grapefruit juice to get into, to make him get into his blood quickly. Uh, Orton was, had his head, uh, I call, in the book, I say, it was cratered like a candle. And from the coroner's reports, that's indeed what happened. The, the, there was an estimate of nine blows with a hammer. There was a note on Orton's diaries that said, uh, if you read this, especially the latter part, all will be explained, K.H. What happened that night, to me, is still a mystery. And I really never could believe that he would have done a thing like this. No. Because I think Joe uh, would always have been with Ken, would always stay with Ken and thing, because I think they were two that, uh, probably if they did row, but uh, I think they were two that would still have kept together, no matter what happened, you know, whether he went forward or dried up or whatever. I think he would have stuck, and they would both stuck together. But whether the other chap didn't think this, I don't know. He must have had some sort of a fear. I think it was fear. Must have Could had. Have been some sort of fear. A fear of what? A fear of... A fear, a fear of losing Joe. When we got home, we talked about ourselves and our relationship. I think it's bad that we live in each other's pockets 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. When I'm away, Kenneth does nothing, meets nobody. What's to be done? He's now taking tranquilizers to calm his nerves. Monday, May the 1st. Kenneth H. had a long talk about our relationship. He threatens or keeps saying he will commit suicide. He says you'll learn then, won't you? And what will you be like without me? We talked and talked until I was exhausted, going round in circles. He said he wasn't going to come away to Morocco. He was going to kill himself. I've led a dreadful, unhappy life. I'm pathetic. Well, this is where Howell said, we're living Strindberg. This is the dance of death. And where the fights occurred, and also, to some degree, where they had all their tremendous pranks. It was from that front window that they dropped prophylactics that they'd blow up as balloons, one of the cordons, uh, hollyhocks, and do all those pranks, which were, in a sense, typical of their, uh, Orton's unmastered aggression, the, the kind of aggression that he mastered finally in his plays. I'm uh, not asking for my handbag back, nor for the money you've stolen. But unless my dress and wig are returned, I shall file a complaint with your employer. You have until lunchtime. She'll be sodden before long. Have you a family, sir? Uh, my wife felt that breastfeeding might spoil her shape. Though from what I remember, it would have been improved by a bit of nibbling. Oh. She's a fine example of inbreeding amongst the lobelia growing classes. A failure in eugenics accompanied by a liking for alcohol and sexual intercourse made it most undesirable she become a mother. I hardly ever have sexual intercourse. You were born with your legs apart. They'll send you to the grave in a Y-shaped coffee. My trouble stems from your inadequacy as a lover. It's embarrassing. You must have learned your technique from a Christmas cracker. Rejuvenation pills have no effect on you. I never take pills. You take them all the time during our lovemaking. The deafening noise of your chewing is my reason for never having an orgasm. How dare you say that? Your book on the climax in the female was largely autobiographical. Oh. Or have you been masquerading as a sexually responsive woman? My uterine contractions have been bogus for some time. Orton was the child of an unusually bleak marriage. His father was a gardener, his mother a barmaid. He, his brother and two sisters were brought up in a working-class district of Leicester during the 40s and 50s. The world that we inhabited um, in the early days was just a world of work and scraps of bought pleasures, you know. Marilyn, Dougie and Joe and myself, in the summer holidays. We used to go on bikes and we used to swim in the canal. Hello? Can I come in? Mm. Does it bring back memories? Mm, it does. 
Yes, yeah, very mixed feelings actually about the place. Not very nice. Wouldn't like to um, to go back to my childhood. Certainly not. Very impoverished. In what way not nice? I don't know. Very lonely. No. <clears throat> no physical love. Um, sort of children, when they think back, usually think about <clears throat> mum and dad and brothers and sisters with fondness. I suppose, I suppose it was with mum being out at work all day and having to fend for oneself and those memories are not good. The estate was labelled a slum area, really. I mean, if you said he lived in the Saffron Lane, people sort of thought, oh dear, you know, you know what sort of people they are. But looking at it yesterday, it seemed to be line for line the same as um, Joe wrote about in Entertaining Mr Sloan. This, um, when Sloan says a perfect skyline you've got here, Lord Snowden would give you something for a shot of that. Stunning it is. Stunning. Perfect skyline you got there. Stunning it is, stunning. We tried putting in for one of them flats. No good. If my boss was alive, I'd have gone to him. He knew the right people. Dead, is he? No, he was murdered. On the unsolved crimes list, he is. A murderer not brought to justice? That's a sobering thought. Somebody said all your father wanted in his life was a greenhouse, and he never had one. Was that not right? much chance of putting a greenhouse here, was there? No, no, he... He was a man of little ambitions, really. He would have loved a greenhouse, but he never aspired to that, so... And Joe used to have a hammock suspended between these two posts. And he used to lay in this hammock and think he was on some Caribbean island. And he used to put his... his glass of water in that there and... It was hot. He used to, nobody else could get in the hammock because he used to. That was his. He made it out of a bit of old carpet and and rope. And last, as he shocked you once. Oh yes, he used to lay here, outstretched and fiddle with his nipples. And I used to think he was ever so rude doing that. I used to think, oh, what's he what's he doing that for? Is he getting some sort of sexual excitement out of that? If he came to the Saffron Lane area, he wouldn't poke fun or mock um, the, the person that was really trying to be sincere. It was just the pretentious sort of person that um, tried to be something that he wasn't. That, that made Joe laugh. My, my mother was a very pretentious woman in many ways. And I mean, I say that in the most fondest way. She would do things and wear things that remind me of Cathy. We ended up at a fabulous place. Soft music, pink shades, lovely atmosphere. One of the hostesses gave me a number, told me to ring her. Take no notice of her, Mr. Dredd. She might not be nice, she might be a party girl. You know, you're developing distinctly possessive tendencies. <coughs> Mama can't be possessive. That's oh, naughty. Oh, oh. Never heard of a possessive mom. Oh, Mr. Sloan, that's rude. You cheated, you to say that. You're spoiling yourself in my eyes, Mr. Sloan. Don't know why you want to bother with these girls when you have your friends for company. They're boys. Well. You disgust me, you do, sitting there without your teeth. You disgust me. My teeth, Mr. Stone. 
Since you mentioned the matter, which a true gentleman would hesitate to which do. Which a true gentleman would hesitate to do, Mrs. Are in the kitchen and sturgeon, unlike some who are careless with their dentures. I allow mine a good soak almost every night. <laughs> do I really disgust you? You horrify me. In the early diaries, he wrote, wish I was a member of the idle rich. What was his way of escape? Um, well, he had elocution lessons from a woman called Madame Rothery. <laughs> there was nothing Madame-ish about her at all. And um, he, through her, she sort of coached him uh, up to RADA standard, uh, but she was absolutely convinced that he'd never get to RADA. He had a slight list. And, um, but Joe sort of uh, was determined to get out of Leicester. And uh, he won a scholarship to RADA. It was summer 1951 that they both entered, in fact. And here, in this uh, rather battered volume, you'll see John Orton's name, John Orton as he was, down here, having entered that year. And also, on another page, because he was in a slightly different group, Kenneth Halliwell. It's quite interesting because um, every term, Actors were tested up to a point, you know, in certain parts they play. And um, the then principal used to make notes. His name was Sir Kenneth Barnes. And he used to make notes, I suppose, snap decisions or snap judgments, in fact, which perhaps it's a little unfair to quote. But of course, it's rather interesting with hindsight. And I noticed that in uh, John Orton's case, he played the clown in Twelfth Night in his first term. And Kenneth Barnes had written against it, surprisingly mobile. At the same time, um, his pal, Ken Halliwell, was playing Jayquiz in As You Like It. And all we get from that was, seems to have a sense of philosophy. In fact, I suppose the remarks made about John Orton are slightly more intriguing than those made about Halliwell, who gives me the impression of being something of a plodder. Halliwell came from a middle-class environment. He was a mother's boy. His father was very taciturn and quiet, and a great trauma in Halliwell's life happened at the age of 11 when a bee stung his mother on the tongue, and she died within 10 seconds in front of him. The whole family life ended when he was 17, only seven years later, when he came downstairs and found his father with his head in the oven. This is very interesting. What he did was he stepped over his father, put on the kettle, turned off the gas in the oven, made a cup of tea, went upstairs to shave, and went next door to tell the next door neighbors that his father was dead. Kenneth was always sort of rather self-conscious. He blushed. And another thing I remember, he carried about him always an enormous pocket handkerchief. I'm saying enormous because he was so small. He had an acute sense of the ridiculous and a very, very good eye for inventiveness, for comedy. And uh, this was very useful in mime or movement, you see. And uh, he had certain personal mannerisms that were, I suppose were rather curious, but I found fascinating. I liked his appearance, you see, the shaved head. The shaved head? The shaved head, yes. It was rather egg-like, and I told him so and asked him why he shaved his head. He said it was cooler. And uh, he liked all that uh, get-up. I think he found it rather practical. So it's Halliwell see. always who's the stronger personality. Oh, yes, yes. Comes out as the more dominant one, certainly. Did you get the impression then that Halliwell and Orton were beginning their affair? Because that's where it started, rather. Only by a little element of shyness when we met afterwards, around the corner, and we're having a coffee. And um, Joe, with the, that uh, lovely little bright face, would be listening, looking, and be rather shy of intruding in any way. Uh, they would then walk me to Good Street tube station, say cheerio to me, and uh, one just sensed, sensed something there, a little liaison was starting in the look in the eye, something. Halliwell, who was an orphan, who wanted friends, who was 20, by the time he went to Rada, was 26 and bald and very morose and very unappealing in the sense that his own insecurity, his own self-consciousness made him 
even then make claims for himself which were preposterous. He was going to win the, the uh, this prize or that prize, and his, that performance was terrible, and his was good, etc. Um, he needed a friend. He needed someone to, as it were, to be to be the perfect friend. Here comes this country boy, who looks at a man who's actually well read, who is eager for friendship, and miss misapprehends him. He thinks that Hallowell is sophisticated. Hallowell wasn't particularly sophisticated at all at that time, or at any other time. But he thinks that this is sophistication, because he is ill-read, because he isn't really educated at all. And he, very much like Sloane, is talked into a relationship that we know he didn't necessarily want. But what is all this laying about in the dark, anyway? Got a headache or something? Yes. Well, I'm not surprised. Fresh air is what you need. It's no good playing for sympathy with me, you'll find. I've heard all this you've been telling my sister, all this about you being an orphan and everything. Well, it must have been a rotten life for a kid, being an orphan and everything. Mixed home, was it? Just boys. I do. How many to a room? Eight. Really? Same age, were they, or older? Mm, the ages varied by a year or two. You had your compensation, then. <laughs> Keep you out of mischief, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, as I was saying, the fact is, uh, well, perhaps I was wrong. I just felt that my sister was uh, taking on too many responsibilities. Uh, she's a charming woman, as a rule. Yeah. Married? No. Wise man, wise man. Girlfriends? No. No, you're a librarian. No. No, oh, that's what she said. No, I help out at Len as a tobacconist, just on Saturdays. Oh, I see. He's a mate of mine, Len. You might have chance to cross him. He was a sailor, too. Lifeguard at the baths one time. Nice chap. Mm. Fond of swimming, are you? Oh, like a plunge now and then. Bodybuilding? Bodybuilding? Soccer? Pole vault? Long distance? Hundred yards? Discus? Putting the shot? Relays? Hammer? Javelin? 440? Hurdles. My word. Yeah, someone all rounder. Great all rounder. Anything you care to mention? He was a man who had some money, who inherited some money, who would keep him. Uh, who had a, they had a lot in common. They all, they both, all, what they also had in common was they both wanted to be famous. And Orton provided the gaiety, the the the, the fun. And Hallowell provided the, the learning, the mind, the kind of... Orton was the sort of Dionysian force to some degree. Don't want to play that up too much, but that is to some degree. And, and, um, and uh, Hallowell was discipline, control, uh, order, you know, and, so, and to some extent knowledge. And those two opposites combined and made, I think for a while, from all we can gather, a very happy, a happy team, because they had a mission. They had a goal. Their goal was to get educated and get published and get famous. The first people to hear from this extraordinary literary partnership were two publishers, Richard Brain and Charles Monteith. I'll show you if I, if I just might interest you. Uh, one of the submission letters. Now, the next one that came along was uh, the boy hairdresser, signed rather neatly, you see, Kenneth C. Halliwell and John K. Orton. Always, for the, for the first year or two, they came in with this sort, a very yes. prim, old-fashioned little submi uh, submission signed together with two separate signatures. And they were all the work of both of them? That's right. Oh, certainly so, yes. Who do you think wrote what in those early works? Well, we hadn't any of you at all until we actually met them. Would you like me to talk about that? Yes, I would. Uh, that, that, I think, is how we first began to speculate. Who wrote? Na na naturally, we talked a lot about this strange pair sending in this flood of stylish but 
ultimately unpublishable manuscript. Not unpublishable like in grounds of obscenity, but they just weren't quite right up to that stratum you need for the, the publication of this particular kind of thing. Um, so we got so curious uh, about them, rather obsessed by curiosity about them, that we simply wrote and said we'd like to meet them. And we made a, uh, an, an appointment. We met them in the Imperial Hotel in Russell Square, in the Balm Court Bar, I think. Uh, and there we saw this bizarre couple uh, for the first time. Uh, we thought we'd have some difficulty you know, spotting them, but some of them looked so peculiar that we had no doubt at all it was them. Halliwell began Orton's literary education. Together they made lists of metaphors, titles, fragments that might be of use to a writer, as Orton wrote in his posthumously published novel, Head to Toe. Gombold bought a dictionary and began to study the construction of a sentence. He started to construct the perfect sentence. He studied the chemistry and behaviour of words, phrase design, the forging, casting and milling, the theories of paraphrase, the fusing and aiming. I think John did the typing, the actual writing, and the awkward over-elaboration of this rather fantasy style was very much um, Ken Halliwell's. Wasn't unlike, you know, Rofe, Hadrian the Seventh. Exactly. It was and that and kind of prose. I think the first time we noticed what subsequently we learnt to be a dramatist at work was when we, at Mill Road, heard their... Um, Mrs Dale. Mrs Dale's diary, which they had um, tape recorded and uh, included every manner of sort of obscene confrontation that... That's the right. characters in the standard Mrs. Dale's diary could um, yeah. take part in. Um, it was, it was t they tape recorded from the, the radio the introductory music of Mrs. Dale's diary, which of course is now, I suppose, a semi forgotten program, but uh, everybody listened in those days who were in the afternoon. They had tape recorded the music, and by the way, this tape recorder they had bought was one of their luxuries with this extra bit of savings they'd built up. Uh, and then it led into a scene set, I think, in the drawing room in the kitchen of the Dale's household. And uh, I, certainly Mrs. Dale played a prominent part. Uh, and there was certainly either a broken broom handle or a kind of an umbrella with one of those knobbly handles. But all sorts of antics were got up to. And what the only funny bit I can remember was that Dr. Dale himself, as he used to do, I think, in the serial on the radio, used to come in at the most odd and embarrassing moment and say, well, time for a cup of coffee. Um, and then it all petered out with the um, tailing off music. We used to visit Joe my sister and myself, and my mother, once a year. Had a day trip to London once every year. And um, I can remember when we first went down, my mother wanted to go to the, to the lavatory. And you showed her into the bathroom, and she was absolutely amazed, because over the bath, there's this huge naked man that somebody had painted. And she thought it was just terrible. She thought that was awful. And we used to have things like Battenberg cake and sandwiches. It was always, he was always, I got the feeling at those times, that it, not always, but at times he was setting us up just to see our reaction. He just loved to be the fly on the wall, Joe did. And um, he used to have this Battenberg cake and he used to bring it in. And it was just an ordinary Marks and Spencer's Battenberg. And he used to say, isn't it? Wonderful! Look at the shape. It's so symmetrical, isn't it? Look at it. It's absolutely wonderful. And it, you always remind me of the king's new clothes, isn't it? Oh, isn't it? Ah, oh, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> they entertained us, um, and it, it was a, one of the most bizarre and terrible meals I've ever eaten. Because to save their money, to make their lump of savings last as long as possible, uh, they used to live mostly on rice and fish, and uh, some golden syrup, which they thought was very nourishing. Uh, the whole thing cost very little, so we had a meal consisting mainly of rice, fish, and golden syrup. Well, the first course was rice and sardines, and the, <laughs> the second course was rice. differently cooked rice with golden syrup. Golden syrup, that's right. Oh. And then we did discover then, in fact, how they passed their day, which I'd never been quite clear about, and I, I found it absolutely fascinating. If they were living off their savings, uh, and there were nothing, so to speak, to do except write, they, they didn't write all day, but to save electricity, they would get up at first light. They passed the time by reading aloud to each other very long books. They would then write, and then somehow we all broke off. And there was one very yeah. sad day, and I was on holiday in Greece, I remember, years ago, 
when I picked up, uh, I'd been wandering around uh, in the Halkidiki, I mean, the north of Greece, and with a couple of friends, drifted into um, Salonika, Thessaloniki, f- uh, for a day or two, and there bought, as one does in a weak-minded sort of way, I think, some of the English papers from there and sailed at a vastly expensive price. And looking at the time, saw this appalling report of two young men being sent to jail for mutilating books from public libraries. And then I read it and thought, oh, my goodness me, it's, it's, it's um, Kenneth and John. Uh, that yes. wrote them off after that. I thought, well, dear, dear, dear. I mean, that, that it, wasn't, it, it wasn't altogether appalling. It was also quite funny. Well, it was one evening. Um, my father was watching, no, uh, was reading the Daily Mirror, and um, it had an headline, something like "Gorilla Among the Roses." And father, who was King Gardener, thought, "Oh, I will read this. See, it might be a bit about eyebrows." <laughs> <laughs> and and he realised that um, it was his son. So he went. Mother was always in bed anyway early. And uh, he dashed upstairs and said, uh, we used to call her mum, mother. That's right, I used to call her mother. Mother, our Joe's been nicked. It would be somewhere around about 1960. Now and again, some reader would bring in a book and say, look, I think this is wrong. Uh, and we'd find that there'd been a neatly typed caption pasted in over the original caption at the foot of a picture in a book. Sometimes amusing, sometimes mildly obscene. Gradually, these increased, and then we found a second type of thing started developing, and this was alterations to the actual book jackets. There's one here, it may not be very visible there, the pictures are rather small. It's a book about the great Tudors, and each one of the pictures has had a different face. That, in fact, is a monkey's face, carefully pasted over the original face on the photograph. Um, A certain number of biographies, where there was a portrait of the original uh, biography on the front of the book, were changed. This one of Robert Helpman has got a couple of people wrestling there on the front. Um, another uh, biography was this one of John Betjeman, where the portrait of Betjeman has been replaced by a man with his whole body tattooed. Then we started getting these rather surrealistic ones. Uh, there's a similar one, one which was mentioned in the uh, original trial for theft uh, of the picture of a monkey pasted over the middle of a rose in a book on roses. Uh, there's another one here which is mildly amusing. Uh, it's the novel, The Steel Cocoon, and there's a very tight jock strap pasted there underneath the title. Then we started getting some worked on the illustrations inside the books. Uh, this one here in a biography of, uh, I think it was Gertrude Lawrence. I'm not quite sure. Uh, this is a view, uh, a still from the film, which is shown as an illustration, uh, in which she's playing the part of Edith Cavell in a prison cell. And over here on this side, there's the warder looking through the prison cell door at her. And in the middle is the middle torso section from a Greek statue, at which she's gazing. Underneath it says, during the Second World War, I was working from dawn to dusk to serve the many thousands of sol- sailors, soldiers and airmen. American GIs came in shoals to my surgery, and some had very peculiar orders for me. And that was the picture that illustrated it. We had quite a series of these Golanx books. This is an old and rather tatty cover now. But you can see, they used to have an almost facsimile typewriter blurb down here. And by carefully taking this lot out, cutting down there, reversing the paper to get the blank side, they were able to place that back in position with a typewritten blurb on it. Um, Most of these blurbs were written in the true style so that one started reading almost without realising that this was a thing which had been doctored. I'll read you a little bit of this one. When little Betty McDree says that she's been interfered with, her mother at first laughs. It is only something the kiddies picked up off the television. But when, sorting through the laundry, Mrs. McDree discovers that a new pair of young Betty's knickers are missing, she thinks again. It goes on like that. (coughs) They go to the police station, and young Betty identifies PC Brenda Coolidge as the attacker. A search is made of the women's police barracks. What is found there is a seven-inch phallus and a pair of knickers of the kind used by Betty. All looks black for kindly PC Coolidge. What can she do? This is one of the most enthralling stories ever written by Miss Sayers. 
It is the only one in which the murder weapon is concealed, not for reasons of fear, but for reasons of decency. And he goes on to say, read this behind closed doors and have a good shit whilst you're reading it. Now, that's the sort of thing that shocked quite a number of our readers, the elderly, more ladylike ones. <coughs> I must say that I and many of my colleagues almost looked forward to seeing these. They were, they were amusing to us, but at the same time, of course, this was... <coughs> This was uh, an attack on our books. Our book stock, of which we were very proud, was being attacked by predators. Well, we had the names of uh, Alton and Halliwell, who lived at 25 Knoll Road, Islington. We called in uh, the Islington police, and I saw with Mr Croft at the time, uh, Detective Sergeant Hermitage. And I remember correctly, it was Easter Thursday, just before Good Friday. 1962 and uh, he said well look this is not a matter for the police this is a civil matter and I said with the deputy well look this is nonsense these books are obscene we've got a whole cabinet full of them and uh, he said well no uh, definitely a civil matter but his parting shot was look if you can get a letter written on the typewriter that's been used on these dust covers of the books then we'll have a look at it so that was our problem I said, OK, if you're setting us that problem, we'll see what we can do. Sidney Porritt wrote to Halliwell in an official capacity and accused him of being the owner of a car illegally parked in Knoll Road. Needless to say, Halliwell did not own a car. And did you get the reply? In came a reply. Dear sir, I should like to know who provided you with this mysterious information. Whoever they are, they must be a liar, a moron, probably both. I have never possessed a car of any mate whatsoever and never wish to. I can only presume that someone is staging a leg pull with you or me or both. I would suggest that in future you obtain your information from some more reliable source before pestering people with inexplicable letters. Yours contemptuously, signed Kenneth L. Halliwell, Kenneth L. Halliwell. Well, the letter did the trick. Um, I, being quite um, zealous about it, already got myself a watchmaker's glass, and I was satisfied that it was the same typewriter. I'm sorry if I have to say this, but in my view, it was nothing else but common theft. He, he may have become successful later on, but to me, he was a, they were both a stealer of library books, stealer of other people's property. Their term was six months. Actually, Joe did quite enjoy prison. I mean, Halliwell tried to commit suicide twice, but Joe didn't. And uh, I was determined to write to him, even though he didn't want to. I, mean, I think there was only about two letters that came from prison, and one was at the beginning, and one was right at the end. And the one at the end was quite revealing, really, because he said that... Um, He'd found detachment in his writing. Well, I, in my naive way, really, I didn't understand what he really meant by that. I mean, it didn't really mean much. And that the old whore society had really lifted up a skirt and the stench was pretty foul. I realised that, that he'd had some sort of revelation in prison. I'm going to ask you a question or two. I want straight answers, nothing a piss take. Is that understood? Do I make myself plain? I'm talking English. Do you understand? Yes. Oh, all right, then. As long as we know. Now, be sensible. Where's the money? By now, I'd say it was halfway up the aisle of the church St Barnabas and St Jude. Ah! Jesus! How dare you! He's only a boy! I'm not impressed with his sex, miss. I asked for the truth! I'm telling the truth! Understand this, lad. You can't get away with cheek. Kids nowadays treat any kind of authority as a challenge. We'll challenge you. If you oppose me in my duty, I'll kick those teeth through the back of your head. Is that clear? Yeah. Would you excuse me, Inspector? You're at liberty to answer your own doorbell, miss. That is how we tell whether or not we live in a free country. Where's the money? It's in church. Don't. Uh, lie to me. I'm not lying. It's in church. 
under any other political system, I'd have you on the floor in tears! You've got me on the floor in tears! Where's the money? Church, I've told you, they're quoting St Paul over it! I don't care, they're quoting a highway code over it! One last chance! Where is it? In church, in church! My dad's watching the last rites, 104,000 quid! I'll hose you down! Ah! I'll chlorinate you! You'll be laughing on the other side of your bloody face. They've had an accident. Loot was Orton's mature revenge on society. On his release from prison, he wrote his first performed play, Ruffian on the Stair, for BBC Radio. It explored the world in which he and Halliwell had lived, with detachment and compassion. I filled in a form to the effect that I'm a derelict. Yeah. My brother and me had the same trouble. Ah, they haven't the insight into the human art that we have in Ireland. We lived in Shepherd's Bush. We had a little room. And our life was made quite comfortable by the NAB for almost a year. We had a lot of friends. All creeds and colours. But no circumstances at all. Oh, we were happy, though. We were young. I was 17, he was 23. Well, you can't do better for yourself than that, can you? We were bosom friends. I I've never told anyone that before. I hope I haven't shocked you. Uh, as close as that? Well, we had separate beds. He was a stickler for convention, but that's as far as it went. We spent every night in each other's company. It was the reason we never got any work done. Yeah, well, there's no word in the Irish language for what you were doing. In Lapland, I have no word for snow. No, I'd rather not hear about it. I'm, uh, I'm not a priest, you know. Orton wrote Entertaining Mr Sloan later the same year. He came to see me after he'd written, uh, after he'd written Sloan, and I wrote and said I rather liked it. I thought it was funny, a little bit derivative, a little bit conventionally written, and I told him so. And he said, well, if you don't like it, I'll try and write you a better one. So when he was leaving, I said to him, what are you living on? So he said he was living on national assistance, which at that time was £2.10 a week. So I thought, oh my God, how can anybody live on £2.10 a week? So I rang up Michael Codron and said, it's a rather interesting play, and uh, the author's living on £2.10 a week, and you've got the uh, arts theatre, why not read it? And within six weeks, it was on. I met Joe uh, to dinner. It was given by Michael Codron. He rung me and said that he, he put on the production of uh, Entertaining Mr Sloan, which I'd seen at Wyndham's, and Michael said this was the most singular new talent to come into the British Theatre, and he thought I should meet him. He was then, Joe, engaged on writing the, um, the play Loot, which hadn't got a title. And it was, I think, about halfway completed, and Michael said he thought that I should meet him because there might be a very interesting part for me, and Joe liked my work. And I went along to meet him at Michael's house. Uh, he said to me, Michael, before the whole thing began, I warn you, we'll have to have the friend there. And I didn't realise the implications of this until I actually met Halliwell. And um, the conversation of Joe's was punctuated by interruptions from Kenneth Halliwell. He, he would say, Joe, um, oh, yeah, we went to see this thing on Wednesday night, and, it, and then the other one, Halliwell, would say, no, it wasn't Wednesday. How could it be Wednesday, Joe, when that was the time we were seeing... And then he mentioned something else. And so Joe said, oh, you know, it, wasn't, it was Tuesday. That's right, it was Tuesday. Yes, it was Tuesday. Yes, uh, anyway, we went there Tuesday. got there about seven. And then Halliwell, no, it wasn't seven. How could it have been seven? We didn't leave the house. And, and I found this aggravating and extremely annoying. And I remember saying to Joe afterwards, uh, at some juncture when we were alone, that endless correction, it's almost shrewish, wife-like business, must irk you. And he said, oh, no, it's all right. I'm quite used to it. No, it's all right. No, he's got a, got a thing about accuracy. And that was true because the, the editing mind of Halliwell, which was very much in evidence when you came to things like rewrites, uh, manifested itself 
in a very interesting way. I know on two dif different occasions, Joe would suggest a line and Halliwell would say, no, that's over long, and condense it. Now, I saw that happen twice, and I thought, oh, yes, that is interesting. They were both tremendously devoted to one another, the kind of relationship that only men have, and probably English men. There's a special kind of friendship between men, don't you think? Not necessarily homosexual, but this happened to be as well. And uh, he used to talk about our play. Sloane was always our play. And after he'd seen me for the first time and we were going to do it, he brought Kenneth the second time himself. And he was, Kenneth was included with everything. And it had always seemed to me that Halliwell was an influence in the work. They read the same things together, they enjoyed the same things together, they laughed a lot of the same things together. Joe was very funny. The Halliwell uh, and his uh, letter writing, which was the Edna Wellthorpe stuff, they both got a tremendous kick out of, and they were very funny, those letters. He wrote to the vicar and said, you know, can we have the church hall, as Edna Wellthorpe, because he said they wanted to mount their controversial plea for homosexual tolerance entitled Nelson was a Nance. And we know that the vicar would sometimes let the church hall for nothing, in worthy causes. And they got her an irate letter back, saying, on the contrary, I can't possibly permit the church hall to be used for that purpose, and I don't approve either of the lampooning of a national hero. And so they wrote again and said, oh, come, surely the church, of all people, should take a merciful view. Went on and on about, you know, everyone should be understanding about these queens. And then another letter came back saying, I'm sorry, no, I don't share your views. And then he wrote again as Mrs. Wellthorpe saying, doubtless you read of my daughter Edna's demise as she's passed away and I found in a cupboard under the stairs a voluminous amount of correspondence dealing with her work with the Spectre amateur players, the Spectre group they were called, uh, mounting her controversial play, Nelson was a Nance and could we have the church hall? And this went on and on again and the vicar wrote back and said, no, he had not read of the demires and he was very sorry to hear about Edna passing away, but he couldn't help feeling that she'd got in with the wrong set which I thought was a riot, <laughs> that was terribly funny. And they read these things back and they kept carbons of their originals and these all were read back and they, they did the voices, you know, reading, oh, I don't agree at all. And they were doing all these acts, you see, and they were writing as though Edna well thought, oh dear vicar, I feel. And of course you did laugh uproariously at it. They both fell about, they loved that kind of thing. Dear sir, I recently purchased a tin of Morton's black currant pie filling. It was delicious, chock full of rich fruit, then, wishing to try another variety, I came upon Smedley's raspberry pie filling. And really, how can you call such stuff pie filling? I was very disappointed after trying Morton's black currant. Please try to do better in future. And what on earth is edible starch and locust bean gum? If that is what you put into your pie fillings, I'm not surprised at the result. I shan't try any more of your pie fillings until the fruit content is considerably higher. My stomach really turned at what I saw when I opened the tin. Your sincerely, Edna Wellthorpe, Mrs. Dear Madam, we acknowledge with thanks your letter and are concerned to receive your report of Smedley's canned raspberry pie filling. The most modern methods of production are employed in Smedley factories and at every stage the strictest supervision is exercised to ensure that quality is maintained at the very highest level. Your help All these sort of daft, mad dialogues were written and they both got a tremendous kick out of it and that's why I feel that the two of them were essentially uh, sparking off things in each other in a very a lively combination. But professionally, their creative paths were separating. While Halliwell worked on unsaleable collage, Orton wrote the first draft of what was to be his most successful play. Yes, I suppose that was Lute. Certainly Lute was a much better play. And uh, again, Michael bought it, and then he thought he would spend a great deal of money on it, and he got stars, and he got Peter Wood, and a very fancy set, and it was a disaster. People were emptying the auditorium all the time, you know, with that production, because we came under the watch committee in Manchester, because we hadn't got the seal of the Lord Chamberlain, and we had policemen in the wings saying, if you say that line, if you say that line, the watch committee are banning that line, if you say that line, because the policemen had to say, where do you do it? Where the streets are well lit, there are no open spaces, where do you do it? Five pregnancies in one week, where have you done it? And the boy had to say, on crowded dance floors during the rumba. And they said it was a definite um, aspersion and rudeness about the local dance halls. And they weren't having it in the script. And these policemen were there to drag us off if we said these lines. 
While the play was on its pre-London tour, Orton was made to write and rewrite constantly in a desperate attempt to redeem faults of production and casting. I think it possibly opened in Cambridge, the first lute, but it was quite extraordinarily unfunny, and it never got funny. And uh, at Golders Green was, the, was Michael had to decide when it was at Golders Green whether to bring it into London. And he asked me to go and see it on the Saturday. And it was really very, very bad indeed. And uh, when it was withdrawn, Joe was frightfully upset. He knew it wasn't funny and he knew it was a failure, but he had got very fond of Kenneth Williams and Peter Wood and everybody. But then he said to me, well, if we withdraw it, do you think it'll ever go on again? And I said, oh, yes, it'll go on. Of course it will. And within six months back, out of miracle, it did. Michael White got hold of it, and he decided to do it in a very small theatre with Charles Madovitz as a director and a very sordid little set and r rather real actors. It was very funny. There's a uniformed policeman at the door. They're on to us. Oh, it's bluff. No, God works for them. They have him in their pocket like we've always been taught. We've oh, got to get rid of him. He'll find the body next. Remember when we were wrapping her up? It's not something I care to reminisce about. Something dropped out. We couldn't find it. Yes. I know what it was. What? One of her eyes. It's just a Bobby making a nuisance of himself. The theft of a pharaoh is something which hadn't crossed my mind. Whose mummy is this? It's mine. Whose was it before? I'm an only child. A word of warning. Don't take the mickey, it makes me angry. OK. It's not a mummy, it's a dummy. I used it for my sewing. What sex is it? I call it she because of my sewing. The garments were female, and because I'm literal-minded, I chose to believe I was making them on a lady. Splendid. Excellently put. No actual evidence of sex can be given. It's contrary to English law. Yes. A tailor's dummy provided with evidence of sex would fill the mind of the average magistrate with misgiving. Why is it wrapped? We were taking it in the car. To a carnival. She's part of a display. What part? A sewing class. Pre-war. The difference in technique is to be demonstrated. Is this dummy a frequent visitor to exhibitions? Yes. When is the object's outing to take place? She's not going now. The treat has been cancelled? Yes. Why? My mate Dennis was to arrange transport. He let us down. I can believe that. From what I've heard of your friend, I'd say he was quite capable of disappointing a tailor's dummy. Now, you claim this object is awaiting transport to a carnival where it will be used to demonstrate the continuity of British Needlework. Yes. Sounds a reasonable explanation. Quite reasonable. What were you doing on Saturday night? I was in bed. Can you confirm that, miss? Certainly not. What were you doing in bed? Sleeping. Do you seriously expect me to believe that? A man of your age behaving like a child? What was your mate doing on Saturday night? He was in bed as well. What coincidence, miss, don't you agree? Two young men who know each other very well spend their nights in separate beds, asleep. Sounds highly unlikely to me. What is your excuse for knowing him? He's clever, I'm stupid, see? Why do you make such stupid remarks? I'm a stupid person, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, what proof have I that you're stupid? Give me an example of your stupidity. I can't. Why not? Don't believe you're stupid at all. I am. I had a hand in the bank job. <laughs> well, that's stupid, isn't it? Telling you that. <laughs> oh, you, you must be stupid if you expect me to believe you. Why? <laughs> you had a hand in a bank job, you wouldn't tell me. Not unless he was stupid. But he is stupid, he's just admitted it. 
He must be the stupidest criminal in England. Unless... Unless he's the cleverest. What was your motive in confessing to the bank job? To prove I'm stupid. But you proved the opposite. Yes. Oh. There's more to this case than meets the eye. I'm tempted to believe you did have a hand in the bank job. Yes. I shall inform my superior officer. He will take whatever steps he thinks fit. I may be required to make an arrest. The water board can't arrest people. It can in certain circumstances. What circumstances? I'm not prepared to reveal the inner secrets of the water board to a member of the general public. Where's the money? What was interesting and really riveting about the play was that here was a naturally wicked talent. I mean, Orton was wicked. He wanted to be wicked, he tried to be wicked. And here was a play which was like a kind of essay of Peck's Bad Boy, uh, which was... Uh, it was absolutely natural. Of course, it did have these allusions to Wilde and Furbank and all the people that Joe had been reading and had been learning his craft by. But underneath all of those derived influences, there was this amoral character who absolutely uh, uh, enjoyed sex and all its convolutions and saw the absurdity of sex and saw the absurdity of psychiatry and the law and everything else and was able to write about that from the standpoint of an outsider. Orton always insisted that he was more than simply a comic writer. Truscott, who posed as a waterboard official in Loot, was based on Detective Superintendent Chaloner, a policeman who'd planted evidence on student demonstrators. Orton felt he and Halliwell had been so severely treated in the affair of the library books only because they were homosexual. I mean, I know from all my conversations with him that he deplored the, what he regarded as hypocritical the nature of the established English view of homosexuality. Yes, he regarded that as totally hypocritical and maintained that they would turn a blind eye to all kinds of situations if it suited them. Uh, he thought that was evil. Ironically, of course, it is that very combination that d does in turn destroy him, because there's no question about it, it is a homosexual entanglement that does destroy Joe. There's no question about that. I mean, Halliwell's jealousy, I mean, his letter at the end says the answer to this can be found in the diaries and the diaries of Joe were entirely accounts of um, promiscuous sex, which Halliwell found a continual threat. The time that I knew Halliwell was, was Halliwell at his worst. And, it, and uh, from what I can gather, they both started off with... It, they equally had strong fantasies of themselves. And what had happened is one had... Joe's had been totally fulfilled and Kenneth's had got nowhere. And Kenneth had become very, very grotesque and queenie. The problem was that Joe was actually, and for 67, circa Sergeant Pepper, all the rest of it, everything was happening to Joe and nothing was happening to Kenneth. And they did actually live in one room. When one imagines that, the whole, that all of these walls, which are now white, were covered with a thousand book plates and that the ceilings were painted, you can imagine how claustrophobic and small it was. To sit in it actually gave, gave me a headache the afternoon I was there. It was like noise for the eyes. I mean, the, the walls were covered in these collages which Kenneth had done, which weren't pleasant collages. There were things like newborn babies being ripped out of Africa and sort of uh, lots of classical paintings around them. There was nowhere you could look which was actually peaceful to the eye. And in the middle of all this, they were giving us... The, Mounds of uh, lion's jam tarts, those very sort of <laughs> factory-made things. And they were very proudly playing us original soundtracks of Paul Joey. I, I don't know what they th I thought they would play us of their record collection, but I was rather surprised at how cosy, in fact, it was. But the relationship, I mean, the whole thing about the relationship would seem that they're trying to escape convention, sexual stereotyping and so on. It's an irony that it comes back to that at the end, doesn't it? Because no one can avoid it, I don't think. I don't, you see, it's all very well to say, as many homosexuals do, Joe among them, that they despise the husband and wife and the rut relationship of the 
the breadwinner and the houseminder. And so that's all very well, but the fact of the matter is that all relationships eventually go into that kind of groove because they can't, you can't have two people going out all the time, otherwise there is nothing done. Do you think they would have stayed together? I think they might well have done. I, I don't know that the sort of flash of success that Joe was having at that time would have sustained itself. And had they got a home in Brighton or whatever, but Kenneth would have had something to do. He would have had a home to run. And all they had was the one room. They found Kenneth unattractive, unwitty, um, rather poisonous. And uh, he used to be, if he went to a party, there would, Kenneth would be standing in a corner and everybody would be surrounding Joe. And I think that's how it started. And of course, um, particularly in those days, Nigel, as you remember, uh, any new playwright was picked up. I mean, they wanted to find new playwrights, and because Joe was new, the newspapers and everybody spoiled him. And uh, I think it began to very slightly poison Joe, too, because he began to enjoy these successful parties. And although he always laughed at them, I think it did have a slight effect on him. And certainly he was less at home, and, and Kenneth was more lonely. The night that, just prior to him murdering Joe, it was the first time that we had ever seen him on his own. We'd either seen Joe come to rehearsal, come to the play, or Joe with Kenneth. But this night, he turned up on his own, and he sat in, at that time, there was a panto at the Criterion alongside Luton. Simon and I had the same dressing room, and he sat in our dressing room on the sofa, and he was saying, I thought of the title Loot. I, he was justifying his existence in a very pathetic way. Because you and Simon were giving a hard time for being there. I mean, why did he No, feel... not at all. We were, we were indulging him, but Sheila was very frightened by the state that he was in. They used, to, they used to let us into their lives. They, Kenneth had once showed us a, a double-page spread in a, in a colour supplement, which was all pills, all those plastic-coated sort of, like, bombs, all in rows, and he showed us all the ones that he had. The last time I saw Ken, I saw him alone. I mean, Ken because he'd been to the drugstore at the corner, because I'd got them on to national... Uh, they were both on national health, and I think they, they were suffering from withdrawal symptoms from hash or something that they'd had in... Um, I don't know where they'd been for a holiday. And I said, well, you must go to my doctor. And so he came here by himself, and the doorbell rang, and he came into... I lived downstairs then, and... He sat and talked to me, and I'd never been alone with Ken Hallowell ever before. And he talked in such a strange way. I don't know if you've ever met people who are mentally ill, but once you have, you can recognise it. And when he left, I rang Joe, because they used to use each other's voices on the telephone. You never knew which you were talking to. They could... You mean they imitated each yes, other? Yes, perfectly. How extraordinary, deliberately. Oh, yes, so you couldn't... I mean, never know. But I did know on this occasion that Ken couldn't be there. So I said to Joe, the party that Dorothy Dixon had arranged for him, which was one to meet all the older people, like Evelyn Williams and people like that, who were very interested in him, and he had agreed to go to that with me. I said, we'd better cancel that, because I think you must be with Ken, because I don't think he's at all well. Little knowing what would happen. That was shortly before? About three days. If that, I think the day before almost. I think it was a Monday and the thing happened on Tuesday. I mean, if you have ever tried to do an atheist funeral, the best of possible luck. And I must say, Joe would have laughed because when we arrived, they asked us if we were the 2.30 or the 2.45, which was an absolute Joe Orton line. It was a sort of um, bijou crematorium. And as the coffin came in to the crematorium, over these crackly speakers came John Lennon singing, I read the news today, oh boy. And the, the gramophone pin uh, went wrong and it went, oh, and it started to get, oh, God, it was awful. Well, Pinter and uh, Donald Pleasance, at his most sort of uh, 
bald <laughs> to give these readings. At, I can't remember what Pinter did, but, I, but it was something like, don't be moved us, you've missed the joke. It was something like that. And then at the end of the service, after this, this coffin had slid between these curtains, where it was supposed to be burnt or whatever, I mean, it was a sort of theatrical, phony front, we walked into these gardens at the end of the, the chapel, and there were television cameras on us all. It was difficult to look on it as real, but there were lots and lots of flowers, and lots and lots of, of people. And it was the difference between uh, uh, Kenneth, who had no, nobody there, I think I was the only person there in the family, two aunts and a nephew and myself. But uh, This was, was Halliwell's funeral. This was Halliwell's funeral, whereas Joe's was a very fashionable funeral, with a great deal of floral tributes and things. The friends of Bingo have sent a wreath. Blooms are breathtaking. She looks a treat in a WVS uniform. Though I'd not care to spend eternity in it myself. She's minus her vital organs, isn't she? A necessary part of the process. Where are they? In the little casket in the hall. Such tranquility she has. Looks as though she might speak. God rest her poor soul. I shall miss her. Death can be very tragic for those who are left. Here. Yeah. Her eyes are blue. Mum's eyes were brown. That's a bit silly, isn't it? I expect they ran out of materials. Oh, her eyes not her own, then? No. He's such an innocent, isn't he? Not familiar with the ways of the world. I thought they were her own. This surprises me. Not her own eyes. <coughs> um, that large heart we'll probably put on top of the motor. Um, on the coffin itself, we thought just a spray of heather from her homeland. It'll be a long time before I can believe that she's dead. She was such a, an active sort of person. You're going abroad, I hear. Yes. Where did you get the money? My life insurance matured. Tragic news about your premises. Was the damage extensive? Well, the repair bill will be steep. We're insured, of course. Was your chapel of rest defiled? No. Human remains weren't outraged? No. Oh, thank God for that. There are some things which deter even criminals. I've never been to a funeral before where they had the Beatles playing. It was... well, just the most bizarrest thing I've ever been to. I mean, they didn't have any sort of... Uh, uh, him singing or anything like that. I, I, I'm sure on the, co the the coffin was purple velvet, and it was cremation. So, but um, I didn't know then that um, they were going to have the ashes scattered together, which um, my brother gave permission for that which I condone. Well, I feel that they were both victims and both self... I mean, if Joe had been a little bit more careful, Kenneth wouldn't have killed him. And Kenneth was driven... He was so lonely and so unhappy that the only way he could see the way out was that he would like to have died, but he thought he didn't want to die alone, so he thought he'd better have Joe as well. I think it was really his own death he wanted rather than Joe's death. But you he see, couldn't I... have born to have killed himself and left Joe there, so he had to go too. I wasn't with him when he died. I'm going round the twist with heartbreak. He's dead then? Yes. I thought of topping myself as a gesture. I would have done but for my strict upbringing. Suicide is difficult when you've got a pious mum. Kill yourself? I don't want to live, see? 
But that's a crude way of putting it. I've lived among rough people. You're not going to do it, though. No. I've made a will, of course, in case something should happen in the future. What might happen? I might get killed. Ah. I don't know. I knew that I'd lost a lifeline, uh, uh, somebody to talk to, to explain things that I didn't understand. And um, I just ended up sort of having a, a breakdown. But, um... I mean, I get the impression you were the one in the family he was able to talk to about culture, about art, about things. To a limited degree, really. I mean, because I was unaware, I wasn't, I mean, I don't want to set myself up as being any more culturally aware than any other member of the family. But I just knew that through talking to Joe and that, that he had a, a hell of a lot to offer. And it was having this lifeline cut that, that was very, very sad. It's true also that you, you're very, involved with Orton's work, you read it a lot and... and... Try to be, yes. It's quite difficult, <coughs> actually, even now, even for me. Um, knowing the man in the beginning and now trying to understand the playwright. What do you like about it? What do you like about his plays? Oh, they just make me laugh. Nobody's ever made me laugh like Joe. He's just so funny. The sexual repression and bohemian life of post-war Britain revealed next tonight by the late George Melly. Stay with us on BBC Four for an evocative look around Smoky Dives. <laughs>